Hi everyone. Welcome back. It's week nine. I have just one lecture for you this week. I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into um, the sort of ins and outs of our current healthcare laws and how that law has um, affected healthcare in the U.S. since then, what we know about it, and what um, political actions have been taking place around the law since it passed. Um, so to get started, I want to sort of put this law in the context of the debate that surrounds it. Um, so if you think about health care in the U.S., there tends to be two sides to the argument. This is probably over oversimplifying a little bit, but here they are. On one hand, you have people who believe that healthcare is a commodity. It should be treated like other goods and services, such that if people want healthcare, they should pay for it. Doctors, physicians, other healthcare professionals should be appropriately paid for their services. And so the best way to help people afford healthcare is to get them jobs so that they can buy healthcare, but not by having the government be involved. So that's one side of the debate. Again, this is a simplification, but you'll get the picture. The other side of the debate argues that healthcare is a public obligation. It should be treated like other opportunities, such as education. Quality healthcare should be available to all Americans, regardless of their living conditions or their financial status. It should not be a form of service that is subject to profit making. And this side of the debate believes that the government has a role in financing healthcare and also in regulating the healthcare system. So what this sort of boils down to is this idea of whether quality health care is a privilege or whether it's a right. And a lot of this has to do with the involvement of the government. Um, the people on the side that health care is a privilege don't want the government to be involved in some ways because um, it, uh, that side of the debate sees health care as not, it shouldn't be an entitlement, and also that it would cost the government a lot of money to provide health care to people. On the side of the debate where they argue that it's a right, this is, um, this is the group of people who would say that being healthy is a basic human right, and so the government should provide that opportunity to people. Um, so it's possible that you, as a student, don't care about health care. I think I, as a student, did not care about health care. It was something that was totally uninteresting to me. That has changed as I've gotten older. So you may be reading this week's chapter or articles and sort of not really caring. Um, but many of you are about to go into the quote-unquote real world. You're going to be getting jobs where you have to navigate health insurance and you may have no idea what's going on. So if it doesn't apply to your life now, if it doesn't seem important to you now, in very short time it will. Um, so hopefully this can help you sort of think about it in that way. Well. I think, though, you all care about health, and so I want to sort of also make the case that you should care about health care. So first of all, what we know about people without health insurance is that they do tend to be a disadvantaged socially, so socioeconomically, for example. Um, they tend to be experiencing change, so whether that's moving from one state to another or moving from one job to another, but they also tend to be working. So when you look at people who are uninsured, most of them are, are employed. You have very few people who are unemployed. However, well, not very few, but less, fewer of the people who are uninsured are unemployed. But the people who are employed are typically working at jobs where their hours are not long enough to have their provider or their employer provide health care or health insurance. Um, people without health insurance also tend to delay medical care or go without it, and they also pay more money for that care. But the third thing is that they want health care. So it's not as though, by and large, it's not as though people who are uninsured are just not buying insurance because they don't want it. That is true of um, younger adults for the most part, but for everybody else, most people want health care, but they don't get it mostly because they can't afford it. Um, the costs of health care are a huge challenge. So 20% of people who are insured, so 20% of people who have health insurance, and over half of people who don't, 
say that they have trouble paying their medical bills. Ideally, we would see that being zero, but especially among people who have health insurance, we would want that number to be very low. So I posted an article from The Atlantic on your Blackboard page um, in the module that talks about how medical costs can push people either into poverty or it can sort of push them deeper into poverty. And then we should also care about health care because um, the U.S. spends the most money on health care per person in the U.S., but it also has some of the poorest health outcomes. So to this first point, for example, if you look at this graph, we have fairly high um, average life expectancy. So that's over on this side. So our average life expectancy in 2014 was just under 80. But we spend the most money per person in the United States. So our average, our annual spending is over $9,000 per capita. That's way more than, for example, Greece, who has a slightly higher um, life expectancy, also true of Japan and the United Kingdom. Um, in addition to spending the most money, we tend to have the lowest life expectancy of the 13 richest nations. We have the highest infant mortality rate of the 13 richest nations, the highest rate of multiple chronic conditions. 70% of Americans have more than one chronic condition. We have the highest obesity rate. Um, so those are some examples of how we spend so much money on health, but our on healthcare, but our health as a nation is not what we would expect to get for that money. So before I get into the um, Affordable Care Act, which passed in 2010 and went into effect on 2014, in, in, um, on January 1st, 2014, your book talks a little bit about the history um, I think it's important to know that um, Blue Cross Blue Shield was first founded in 1929, right after the Great Depression. I think your book talks a little bit about this. From 1929 until 2010, there were five attempts to institute some kind of national health care system. So Truman proposed a national health insurance program in 1945, right after the Second World War ended. That attempt failed. In 1965, President Johnson was able to push through Medicaid, which is health insurance for um, poor folks and some other children, people on disabilities, and also Medicare, which is health insurance and health care for people over the age of 65. So that passed, but then in 1974, President Nixon tried to um, usher through some health care reform that failed. In 1980, President Carter, the same, failed. In 1994, President Clinton again failed. So the Affordable Care Act is the first piece of legislation since 1965 that made it through both houses of Congress and was signed by the president. So what does the Affordable Care Act do? Well, it guaranteed coverage, which had not been the case previously. So no insurance company is able to deny a person coverage because they have a pre-existing condition. And they're also not allowed to charge people more money for their health insurance because they have a pre-existing condition. Those are two things that had been legal before the Affordable Care Act went into law. They, the law allows um, young people, young adults, to stay on their parents' insurance until the age of 26. So there's so many more students going to graduate school. There's so many more people who have a tough time finding um, real stable employment right after they graduate from college. So this provides um, health insurance stability until the age of 26. Um, the law expanded Medicaid, and I'll talk about this in a second. Um, the Supreme Court of the United States actually changed this part of the law and said that states were not required to expand their Medicaid program as a part of 
the um, new healthcare reform. So the expansion of Medicaid, which basically means that more people could be eligible to participate in the Medicaid system than before. Typically, it's very, very poor individuals, um, children in poor families, people with some people with disabilities. Um, the expansion of Medicaid would have allowed all adults under 100%, 138% of the poverty line to access Medicaid. The Supreme Court said that this was not constitutional to require states to allow that. And so you'll see in a minute that some states have expanded Medicaid and others haven't. And we'll talk about what the um, implications of that are. It, uh, the Affordable Care Act also put in some um, cost control mechanisms for administrative costs. It requires that the insurance companies, all of them, um, cover 10 essential health benefits. So this includes ambulatory patient services, emergency services, hospitalization, maternity and newborn care, mental health and substance use disorder services, including behavioral health treatment, prescription drugs, rehabilitative services and devices, laboratory services, preventive and wellness services and chronic disease management, and pediatric services, including dental and vision care for kids. So there's a health affairs article on Blackboard if you're interested in reading more about this. The Affordable Care Act requires employers to provide health insurance if they employ more than 50 people. If you are somebody who is not eligible for insurance through your workplace, let's say, for example, you don't meet the full-time requirement. So what you saw after the Affordable Care Act was the law stated that anybody who worked 35 hours or more, I believe, um, had to receive health insurance from their employer. So what a lot of employers started doing was reducing hours for their employees to below 35 hours per week so that they did not have to meet that requirement. So if you are somebody, for whatever reason, who was not offered insurance um, through your employer, you're able to purchase insurance on the marketplace. You also, if you are at the poverty line, which is calculated, the, the amount of money that creates the poverty line is calculated based on income and household size. So the more people you have in your household, the higher the poverty line is for your family size. But if you and your family are either at 100 times, uh, sorry, 100% of the poverty line, meaning you're at the poverty line, or you make anywhere between the poverty line and four times that amount, you would qualify for a government subsidy. So basically, you would get a discount on whatever your monthly payment is to pay for health insurance if you purchased it through the marketplace. And then there's also an individual mandate. I have you listening to a short podcast this week that explains the individual mandate. Essentially what this means is that um, the Affordable Care Act requires everybody to have health insurance. All adults must have health insurance. The reason for the mandate, just briefly, is that if you only have people who need health insurance, those people are probably going to be ill and they're going to be very costly to the insurers because they're going to be using a lot of medical treatment and medical care. If everybody is required to get health insurance, that brings healthy people into the insurance market. Healthy people who are paying for monthly insurance just in case something happens but aren't going to be racking up a lot of bills. So it sort of equalizes and brings down the total cost for the insurance companies. So this was challenged in court, and the case went to the Supreme Court in 2012, but the Supreme Court upheld the rule of the individual mandate, saying that it was constitutional. Recently, in, 2000, in December of 2017, the um, Congress passed and the president signed 
the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, which removes this requirement. So basically what happened is that this new act says um, people are still required to get health insurance. However, it used to be the case that if you did not have health insurance for the entire year, you would have to pay a penalty when you filed your taxes at the end of the year. This new Tax Cuts and Jobs Act says you still have to get health insurance, but you don't have to pay a penalty if you don't get it. So it's sort of like not really enforcing the rule because there's no consequences if you don't follow it. So these are the things that the um, Affordable Care Act put into law. These are sort of the main components of this law. When we talk about Medicaid expansion, you had 33 states up until this graph is from, was updated January 16th of this year. So you have 33 states, including the District of Columbia, who have expanded Medicaid. So what this means is that where previously an adult person who is making maybe um, $3,000 less than what the poverty line is for, for that family size, before the Affordable Care Act, that person would not have qualified for Medicaid, and Medicaid would be free for that person. So that person does not make a lot of money, but that person, if that person was single, unmarried, no children, would not have qualified for Medicaid. Under the Affordable Care Act, the expansion says that anybody who makes less than the poverty line, whose income is lower than the poverty line threshold, would qualify for Medicaid. This went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said it was not constitutional to require states to expand Medicaid. So what you see here is the states in orange are states that have not expanded Medicaid. So what does this mean? Well, it leads to a gap in coverage. So in states that expanded Medicaid, all people who are under I said 100%, I meant 138% of the federal poverty line are covered. Anybody who makes more than the poverty line can go to the marketplace, healthcare.gov, and they can search for an insurance plan that they like, and they put in their age, where they live, and how much money they make, and the, and the website will tell you what your subsidy is or what your discount is on your monthly payment. But in states that did not offer a Medicaid expansion, you have a large group of primarily healthy but very low income adults who, who do not qualify for Medicaid. The rule of the Affordable Care Act is that you have to be at least at the poverty line in order to receive a subsidy from the marketplace. So in states that did not expand Medicaid, you have a gap in coverage for a group of people who could purchase medic who could purchase health care on the marketplace, but they would have to pay full price. And obviously they would not be able to afford that. So this is sort of why the Medicaid expansion was such a hot topic immediately following the passage of the law and continues to be a hot topic because there are still states where this group of people um, essentially cannot afford health insurance. So what has happened since the Affordable Care Act was passed and since it went into effect? So it went into effect in January, on January 1st of 2014. So essentially it's been in effect for four full years. The first year was a little bit rough. So we have had this law in place for four full years and we do have some data. It's not totally up to date. Because this is such a recently enacted law, it's really difficult to tell what the long-term implications are, but I'll talk about two that I think are important. One is the change in the percentage of U.S. adults who do not have health insurance. So we do know that the Affordable Care Act increased access to, to insurance for 
tens of millions of people. So you can see on this graph that the high point is before, so this is the high point is 18% of people uninsured. And this is like in the middle of 2013 or towards the end of 2013. So I think what's happening here between 2012 and 2013, you can see that right here in October of 2013, the marketplace for insurance under the Affordable Care Act opens. And so you probably see people leaving their health insurance plans from their work or perhaps not having health insurance plans anymore from their work and then entering the marketplace to purchase insurance. So from January of 2014 through the third quarter of 2016, you see insurance, uninsured rates start to decline pretty drastically to an all-time low of 10.9% in 2016. So what does that mean in terms of actual numbers of people? You see the number of people without health insurance declining from 57 million in 2013 to 27 million in 2016. So the Affordable Care Act essentially expanded access enough that 30 million people, 30 million more people received health insurance. So what you also notice here is that the rate of uninsured people is starting to go up. Well, what is going on there? The issue here is that politics matters, right? And so the climate around the Affordable Care Act has not been super positive. And when the White House um, switched parties in 2016, we went from a Democratic president, President Obama, who pa who's the one who really ushered through the Affordable Care Act, to President Trump, who's a Republican, there's been a lot more talk around repealing um, Obamacare. That causes uncertainty in the insurance market because insurance companies have no idea whether this law is going to still be around in the following year. So at the end of the year, when they're starting to set their prices, they really don't know what's going to happen. And that causes them to have to increase their prices because they're not really sure who's going to sign up for this or not. The higher the prices, the less accessible insurance is. And so people start to leave their insurance and just opt to go without because it's just getting too pricey. The other thing I want to point out is that the cost of health care has still increased after the passage of the Affordable Care Act. So health insurance has become more accessible, but the cost of health care has still increased. And you can Google this and find a number of different um, graphs that will show you a similar story. Um, this graph here is showing you that in 2016, so these numbers all represent 2016, in comparison to 2011, okay? This light blue line shows you how much the deductibles have increased since 2011. The deductible is the amount of money you have to pay out of your own pocket before your health insurance starts to kick in. So let's say my deductible is $1,000. It's sort of like your car insurance. Oh, it's exactly like your car insurance. So let's say your deductible on your car insurance is $1,000. If you get into an accident and you want your health, and you want your, your health insurance is not going to pay for your car. You want your auto insurance to cover the damage of your accident. I mean, that's the whole reason you pay insurance in the first place, right? They will only pay for your damages after you've paid your $1,000 deductible. Once you pay that, they cover whatever it says in your insurance plan. So maybe they cover all of it. Maybe they cover 80% of it. It depends on the kind of plan you have. That deductible, though, is all you have to pay out of your pocket in addition to the percentage you might have to pay 
for that whole year. So if you get into another accident, your insurance will kick in right away, paying all of it or the percentage or whatever your plan says. It's the similar story with health insurance. But what's happening recently is that people are opting to have plans with higher and higher deductibles in order to keep their monthly payments as low as possible. So you're seeing deductibles of like five or six thousand dollars a year, which means that you'd have to pay that much money out of your own pocket before your health insurance even starts to kick in. So that's one way that costs have increased for individuals in the aftermath of the Affordable Care Act. This is, as I said, the case for overall expenditures on health care as well. Now, it's tough to tell whether increases in the cost of health care are a result of the Affordable Care Act because it's just too soon to tell. But also, we don't have a counterfactual. We can't compare the society we live in now, where the Affordable Care Act passed, to an alternate reality where the Affordable Care Act didn't pass and see what the health care costs would have been. So we really have no idea. It's possible that the Affordable Care Act contributed to increasing costs. It's also possible that the costs would have been higher if the affordable, than if the Affordable Care Act had not been put into place. So it's possible that the Affordable Care Act actually decreased what would have been much higher costs. We really don't know. And it's possible that these were just going to keep going up anyway, and that the Affordable Care Act had nothing to do with it. What's important to note is that Obamacare did not change the fact that our health care system is largely for profit, okay? The stakeholders in this social institution of medicine are largely interested in maximizing their profits. That is true of hospitals, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, and even the healthcare workers. So until that is changed, we probably won't see a lot of decreases in the overall healthcare costs. So now that we live in a world where the Affordable Care Act is a law, since 2010, there have been 70 unsuccessful attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act altogether or to um, do what's called repeal and replace with some other form of healthcare reform. Um, you may have seen this in the news over the last eight years. Um, just in 2017, there were three uh, repeal and replace attempts that made it to a vote. One was called skinny repeal, and I won't go into the details of that here, but that was sort of a, um, a landmark sort of defeat for the Trump administration. This was a vote where... Um, there were two Republicans who had said they would oppose it, and if that happened, then there was a tie-breaking vote, which would be the um, vice president who would have voted for the repeal. And so two senators, Lisa Murkowski and, and um, Susan Collins, voted no as expected, and then John McCain was actually the third vote, which was the death of um, repeal and replace. Uh, and so in all of that, across all this time since 2010, there were many groups who have been opposed to repeal and replace, a lot of stakeholders who have been opposed to repeal and replace because all of the analysis around what would happen if, if the Affordable Care Act was repealed and even replaced is that the number of people who are uninsured would increase again. So one of the sort of lasting things that the Affordable Care Act has done, um, as I mentioned, is decrease the number of people who were without insurance, and that number would rise again. And so you see the American Medical Association, the American Cancer so um, Association, Diabetes Heart Lung Associations, National Health Council, March of Dimes, AARP, there were so many groups, stakeholders who were against this, which is really a shift from where... Um, you know, sort of the origins of healthcare reform began with all of these companies being um, opposed to the government being involved in healthcare. Um, and so, since the infamous John McCain thumbs down vote, we have seen 
um, a number of different attempts to, um, if, you know, repeal and replace isn't successful, a number of different other attempts to sort of undermine the Affordable Care Act or change it. And so in December of 2017, you see the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, removes the individual mandate penalty. So um, you are, it's kind of a tricky thing or a funny thing, you're required still to have health insurance, but there is no penalty that you would pay in your income tax or in your tax returns at the end of the year if you didn't have health insurance. So you are no longer starting in 2019 required to pay a penalty for not having health insurance even though the Affordable Care Act still says that you should have health insurance. In July 2018, um, the administration decreased funding for what are health insurance navigators, people who will help you sort of figure out how to um, get through the insurance system and find a plan that works for you. Fall 2018 is when enrollment in the Affordable Care Act happens if you wanted to get your insurance through the marketplace, you would do it then. And um, that enrollment window has was cut in half last year. And they decreased, um, the Trump administration decreased funding for marketing around that um, enrollment window. And then just this December, um, there was a federal court that has ruled the Affordable Care Act invalid. Um, and so that is actually headed to a federal appeals um, appeals court. So nothing will happen to the Affordable Care Act until there are no more appeals, basically. So the law continues to operate in effect. This, this case will move to a, a federal level appeals court and likely whoever loses that appeal will then ask for the Supreme Court to hear the case. If the Supreme Court decides to hear the case, their ruling will be law. If they decide not to, then whatever the appeals court found will be the law. So we will have to sort of wait and see. This is going to be an important case to follow in the next you know, year or two. So what's next for health care policy? Well, this is going to be a major part of the 2020 presidential election. You might have already seen this if you're following what's going on, people talking about um, different kinds of options. This was something that I think was talked a lot about even in 2016, but certainly in the 2018 midterm elections. Um, you're going to see there are a lot of Democrats in the field who are going to be running against President Trump in 2020. Um, you're going to see probably all of them speaking to health care in some way, shape, or form. Um, and so that might involve making this marketplace um, include plans that are more affordable, finding ways to make these plans more affordable for families um, and individuals. You might hear about what's called a public option, which would be, for example, um, Medicaid, which, as you know, is something that um, is for people 65 and older. Um, the public option would involve basically anyone being able to purchase Medicaid as an option um, as their insurance plan. And so um, the idea there is that if people are buying into Medicaid, Medicaid is not a for-profit insurance company, and so if more and more people are buying into Medicaid, which has a pretty good reputation in terms of um, coverage, the idea is that um, private insurance companies, for-profit insurance companies, would have to adjust their pricing to compete with a low-cost alternative. Um, but that is also very, very expensive, um, and so that's sort of what the debate is about there. And then you'll also hear, if you haven't already, a lot about um, universal health care, which the idea is that you would basically take that Medicaid and you would give it to everybody and it would come out of your taxes. Uh, there's probably a lot of different ways that people have talked about um, paying for this, but this would essentially eliminate private and for-profit insurance companies. That would be the ultimate goal, would be to have something that looks like what Canada or the UK or other European countries have. And on the Republican side, um, President Trump and anyone who may run against him are likely, again, looking to repeal and replace and potentially have a policy that would redistribute the money for the Affordable Care Act to the states and let the states deal with health care on their own. So this sort of gets back to this, you know, broad versus local kind of policymaking, 
um, you know, states are somewhere in the middle, but the argument for this would be that states can take care or they know what, what um, their citizens need and they're the best ones to decide how to spend that money, not the federal government. And, you know, the argument against it, as you've seen with um, Medicaid expansion, is that if you give money to the states, it won't be spent in the same way and you'll have um, potential disparities across different states. So this will be another interesting um, sort of policy next step to follow. So that's it for week nine. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Hopefully you're finding this week's material interesting. There's lots of um, supplemental links because there's just a lot going on around this. And I'm um, looking forward to seeing you guys on the discussion board. Have a great week.